Think about some of the great heroes that we know in Scripture. You, you could probably name several, Moses, Joshua, uh, David, Esther, Peter, Paul. I, I hope through our study of Nehemiah, you come to see him as, as a, a hero or a, a champion of faith that we can learn from and emulate. You know, just like all those other hero, heroes, Nehemiah was a very ordinary man. He became super ordinary in the hands of God. Nehemiah chapter 2, you really have to look back at uh, the last verse of chapter 1. That's kind of the, the lead into chapter 2. We, we read it last week, but let me just remind you, Nehemiah is, is uh, praying uh, before the Lord. He asks the Lord to be attentive to his prayer. He says, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And then he says, I was cupbearer to the king. So the very end of his, his prayer there, Nehemiah 1, he asked for success and he asked for mercy in the sight of this man, referring to Artaxerxes. We'll get there in just a minute. And then he mentioned he was cupbearer to the king. Well, what's happened? Nehemiah has been praying um, for, for weeks now, but the time has come for action. He recognizes the time has come for action. As he's praying, he has sensed that God is going to use him to answer his prayer for the people living in brokenness. That's why he says, hear the prayer your servant is praying and give him success. Even as he prays for that need, he recognizes that God is likely going to meet that need through him. You know, there are many times that we will pray for a need we see in a person's life, or we'll pray, let's say, specifically for a person's salvation. But it's a dawn on us, as God has given us that burden to pray, that he's also calling us to step in and to do something. Nehemiah senses that it's, it's time for action. And the last phrase he mentions there, it, it's almost like he says, oh, by the way, I was cupbearer to the king. Now, why does he mention that? Why is that important? There are several things. Nehemiah served the king of Persia. He was in the capital city of Susa, in, in the palace there, serving the king of Persia. As a servant, Nehemiah doesn't have the freedom to just come and go. He can't just decide, well, I'm going to go on down to Jerusalem and see what's going on and see what I can do to help, because his role was to serve the king. It was not about Nehemiah's wants and desires. It was about the king uh, that he was serving. So for God to use Nehemiah to help the people in Jerusalem, to rebuild the brokenness, to help restore the people, for God to use Nehemiah, something is going to have to change. God is going to have to intervene in some way in Nehemiah's life. Now, notice also, I just read this, Nehemiah refers to the king as this man. Let me assure you, he would never, to the face of the king, address the king as, as this man. Certainly not. But, what's Nehemiah doing here? He's talking with God about the situation. And he's mindful that no matter how powerful Artaxerxes, the king of Persia is, Nehemiah is serving the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's far above and beyond Artaxerxes. God controls the hearts and the minds of kings and he accomplishes his purposes the way that he chooses to. Solomon wrote these words in, in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Artaxerxes was a very par powerful man on the earth, but he was just a man. He was a human being. And this is who Nehemiah was serving. The other thing about Nehemiah's reference to being the cupbearer is that although he was a servant, he did have significant influence. To rise to the position of cupbearer, you, you had to be incredibly trusted. Obviously, the cupbearer was the one who tasted the king's wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned. So Nehemiah had a great deal, or Artaxerxes had a great deal of trust in Nehemiah. It's a very significant role. Um, he, was, he had the confidence of the king, and he also, as cupbearer, he could be assigned other responsibilities. It wasn't uncommon for the cupbearer to take care of some of the financial accounts of the kingdom as well. So Nehemiah's in a very significant role. He has the, the confidence of the king. He's been placed in this position by God. Think about that. Think about Moses and the position that God placed him in to free his people from slavery in Egypt. Think about Joseph and the position God placed him in in order to save uh, Israel from extinction when the famine came. What about Esther? And we could go on and on and on through different people in Scripture that God had placed in certain roles. You could look at it through human eyes and say, well, this happened or that happened. His, his brother sold him into slavery. And then this, no, God was placing them exactly where he needed them. Why? Because God is sovereign over the affairs of his people, and God is attentive to their needs. 
And so he has uh, Nehemiah already in this position. The provision is already made really even before the need existed. One other thing we know from Nehemiah saying he's cupbearer is that Nehemiah, as cupbearer, um, serving this closely to Artaxerxes in the court of the king, Nehemiah had a very comfortable and very successful life. There's no reason for him to have any desire to make that two-month-plus journey to Jerusalem and to live in hardship and live among the rubble and live among broken, broken people. There's no reason, humanly speaking, for him to want to do that because he was very comfortable and very successful where he was. So Nehemiah, to accomplish what God had for him, was going to have to make significant sacrifice for God to use him in this phase of restoring his people. All right, let's jump in at chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 and 2, and I did not pick up my ESV Bible. I picked up my NIV Bible, so I'm going to read with you on the screen chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart." Then I was very much afraid. Well, what's happening here? The month is Nisan. That would be mid-March to mid-April on our calendar. So it's basically four months since the word came to Nehemiah about what was happening in Jerusalem. Four months. We read in chapter 1 that he mourned and he fasted and he prayed for days. Now we know it's been four long months and he has waited patiently. Was he burdened? Yes. Was he heavy-hearted? Yes but he was calm. Nehemiah is not running around here wringing his hands saying, what am I going to do? Why? Because it's not about his plan or his power to invoke change. Nehemiah is not dependent on himself and his own wisdom and his own abilities. Nehemiah's faith was not in his ability. His faith was in God. You see, in chapter one, Nehemiah's response was that he wept and prayed. And now we see that second to that is that he waited and prayed harder to wait, isn't it? God, I, I, I need you to do something now. But do you remember last week we talked about that the purpose of prayer is not to change the hand or the heart or the mind of God. The purpose of prayer is to change us. Perhaps during these four months, God is preparing Nehemiah. And when we have to wait in prayer, it's not wasted time. It's an investment because it's preparation. God's not always going to answer on our timetable, and we may get a little bit squirmy with that, but we have to trust that if God is making us wait, there's a reason and a purpose for that. And you know as well that that time spent in prayer is also not wasted because the time we spend in prayer is what God uses to bring calmness and and peace to our spirit. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, you're probably familiar with the passage. Paul said, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Listen, and the peace of God, which surpasses comprehension, which surpasses human understanding, the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know what happens when you're waiting in prayer is that people around you will say, how can you be so calm in the midst of all this chaos in your life? And your answer is going to be, I I don't know. I don't understand either. It's just God. Because that's what he's promised that he would do. So God's been preparing Nehemiah. Now he finds himself in the presence of King Artaxerxes. And you see that he said there, I had not been sad in his presence. Nehemiah had been grieving for months, but one of two things. It's possible Artaxerxes was at a different uh, palace or residence for a time and has come back here. Or Nehemiah just had not seen the opportune moment So he was careful about his countenance in front of the king, and the king had not noticed up to this point. And that's important because it was very tricky. It was very tricky serving an eastern monarch. They can be very moody and very temperamental. Some of you ladies just had an epiphany. You're married to an eastern monarch. (laughs) Didn't hear any male laughter in there. Any little mistake could set the king off and cost the servant his life. Think back to Genesis 40 with Pharaoh. You remember that when Joseph was in prison, two men were brought to the prison, the cupbearer and the baker. You know why, if you go back and read Genesis 40, you know why they were brought or thrown into prison? Because they offended the king. 
It wasn't an attempt on his life. They just did something that offended him. And if you remember, it cost the baker his life. Pharaoh ends up executing the baker just because he didn't like whatever it was he had done. You see, the monarch in these Eastern cultures was sheltered from anything that would make him upset or make him unhappy. So being sad in the presence of the king was risky. But what Nehemiah knew was time had come for action. And can I say that sometimes we need to be careful that when the time comes for action, that we don't delay? When it takes courage to step out and take action, it would be tempting for us to say, well, I, I, I need to pray a little more. No, Nehemiah recognizes the time has come for action, and so before the king, he has a sad appearance. The king notices he's despondent. He notices his demeanor. He says, we read in the text, this could be nothing but sadness of the heart, but understand another possible and proper translation of that phrase could be evil of the heart. So the king notices something is wrong with Nehemiah, and he's basically saying, listen, you're, you're not yourself today. You're out of it. You're distracted. Is there some evil intent or malicious plot in your heart? That's why Nehemiah says, I was very afraid. In a split second, before he had, could have opportunity to defend himself or to explain his sadness, the king could banish him or have him executed. And listen, Nehemiah goes in before the king. He has no idea how the king is going to respond or if the king will be sympathetic. It's a huge risk that he's taking, even approaching the, t- the king. But listen, Nehemiah's trust is in the king, not the king. Verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2, let's, let's read those together. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Well, Nehemiah gets his first indication that the king is going to be receptive to him. His answer is very wise. You notice that Nehemiah didn't mention Jerusalem. For Nehemiah to go to the king and say that he was wanting to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem to make it more secure would concern the king because doing that would make it easier for the people to rebel, make it easier for the people of Jerusalem to set up their own government against the king. So he doesn't mention Jerusalem. He doesn't mention security. He just mentions the place of my father's graves lies in ruins. It's very wise on Nehemiah's part because Nehemiah knew that these Near Eastern kings we're known to have interest in preserving ancestral graves. And so in verse 4, Nehemiah gets the first indication he's going to find favor with Nehemiah. He's given the opportunity to make request. <coughs> Excuse me. And what is the first thing he does when he's given opportunity? The king says, what is it you want? What does Nehemiah do? He prays. Now, this is not like his prayer in chapter 1. This is a very quick emergency prayer. He doesn't even stop, doesn't miss a beat, doesn't bow his head, doesn't close his eyes. He offers up a quick prayer to the Lord that his answer would be wise. But that quick emergency prayer has been backed up by months of intensive praying. And so he responds to the king. And when you think about his response to the king and then the request he's about to make... You recognize that when we're serving the king, he gives us the words we need to say. Nehemiah didn't have this wisdom in and of himself. He didn't have the wisdom in and of himself to recognize that he couldn't mention Jerusalem or couldn't say he's wanting to secure the city. Nehemiah in and of himself would not know what all he could request from the king and get by with. God gave him that wisdom. I thought about in Matthew 10 where it's Jesus sending the the disciples out and he tells them, listen, you're going to be hauled in before kings and before authorities. Don't worry about what you should say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words at that time. God told Nehemiah what to say. God told Nehemiah what to request. And look now in verses 5 through 8. Let's see what happens as Nehemiah makes this request. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, this is interesting, the queen sitting beside him. We, We have no idea what that has to do with anything, except if you're a husband, 
you probably know sometimes it's good for your wife to be sitting beside you, right? How long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king the letters, that letters be given me to the governors of the r- province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the city, of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. So he's given permission to go. He's given letters for safe passage for those that he uh, encountered, knowing he had the king's authority. He's given all of the materials he needs for the rebuilding. He's even given a military escort, which was more than Nehemiah even asked for. You see in verse 9 that the king set this huge escort with him to protect him. And let me tell you something even more amazing about Artaxerxes fulfilling all that Nehemiah requested. If you go to Esther chapter 4, the, the, the first, excuse me, Ezra chapter 4, the first remnant that had returned with Ezra, there are already people in the land. That's how the word came back to Nehemiah. That first remnant that had returned had actually begun rebuilding the walls of the city. But some of those enemies of the people of Jerusalem sent word to Artaxerxes. They said, Do you know what these people are doing? Do you recognize if they rebuild the walls of the city, they'll probably rebel against you and they'll probably stop paying taxes? And as a result, Artaxerxes sent a decree out and Artaxerxes is the one who stopped the building of the walls. And now, who knows if he even realizes it, he's rescinding his own decree. What does that tell us? That tells us the most powerful king in the Near East is subject to our God. The most powerful king in the Near East is subject to the power of God. God changes the course of of affairs that this king has set in motion. Why? Because this king is subject to the king. He's just a man. He's just a human. God is sovereign in God's plans, and God's ways are not going to be thwarted. Now, that does not mean when we're accomplishing God's plan and doing things God's ways, that doesn't mean that there won't be opposition. If you look in verse 10, you see there are two men, Sanballat and Tobiah. These two men are going to be a thorn in Nehemiah's side throughout this entire process of rebuilding the city. Sanballat was the governor of Samaria to the north of Jerusalem. Tobiah was some type of official under under Sanballat. And Nehemiah shows up. He's got these letters. He's got the authority of the king behind him. And so they become concerned about his interruption of what they're doing or maybe his disruption of the influence that they have. In verses 12 through 16, you see Nehemiah has arrived. It's taken about two months. Verse 12 through 16, he investigates the city, the walls. He went out at night. Why did Nehemiah go out at night? Well, Tobiah and his son have connections to the people in Jerusalem, the people of Judah, because they're both uh, married to Judean women. Nehemiah was concerned that if word got out about what he was doing, that Tobiah and Sanballat would get word of his plans, they'd have opportunity to plot, they'd have opportunity to disrupt, to discourage the people living in Jerusalem before Nehemiah can even garner their support. So he goes out at night, he gets the lay of the land, he, he sees the problem, he sees the potential, and then He calls the people together. Look in verses 17 and 18 of Nehemiah chapter 2. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins, its gates burn. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for the good and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Well, Nehemiah certainly can't do the work alone. You see that when he went out in verses 12 through 16 that he took a few leaders with him, but a few leaders and Nehemiah couldn't accomplish the task. Everyone needs to take part. And so Nehemiah gathers all of the people and to assure them and to give them confidence, he recounts what God has done. He tells them about the hand of the king. He tells them about his approach of the king and what he asked for and all the ways that God had given him favor with the king, this king who had previously stopped the work was now giving his blessing to the work. And it says they strengthened their hands, literally they encouraged each other to do the work. 
Well, the last thing you see in verses 19 and 20, and I'm not going to spend time here because we will get to this in the, uh, in the days ahead, there's going to be opposition. And from Sanballat and Tobiah, you see opposition, you see derision, and making fun of the people, you'll never get this done, what do you think you're doing, rebelling against the king, and you see Nehemiah's simple response, listen, this is God's work, we will prosper. You see, guys, we're, we're his servants. We're going to do his work. We're going to be blessed. You who oppose him, you're going to see the work be accomplished. You're going to see the blessing, but you're not going to have any part of it. You're going to be on the outside looking in. And next week, we'll see where they begin the actual work, the process of, of rebuilding those walls. But before we wrap up this morning, there are many applications we could draw from chapter 2. Let me mention just four things that we need to be reminded of in this section of the story of Nehemiah. The first one is this, God places us in positions of influence. Not just leaders, not just heads of organizations, not just governors, God places all of us in positions of influence within your family, within your neighborhood, within your workplace, within your school, wherever you are, God has you there to be an influence. But like Nehemiah, you're probably going to find to truly be an influence, to truly change things, to truly bring God into the picture, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. You can't just keep doing what you're doing and just suppose that maybe something will change because you're present there. No, you have to speak up. God has you in a place of influence, and, and he wants you to be willing to trust him. We, we sang about faith earlier. Listen, faith is living and dynamic. Faith is not just something we say that we have because we've come to Christ, we place our faith in him. It's living and dynamic. It's not a one-day thing. It's an everyday thing. And you're in a place of influence, and God wants you to have the courage to get out of your comfort zone and step up and step out. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's doing what you need to do. It's taking action in spite of your fear. Secondly, you need to remember, just as Nehemiah was reminded, that God is greater than any man or any circumstance we face. We ought to expect opposition. That's just part of living for Christ in the culture that we live in. Jesus told his disciples that hundreds of years ago. Don't be surprised when opposition comes against you. Opposition's part of it, but remember, God is greater than any man or any circumstance that we face. Nehemiah saw that in his encounter with Artaxerxes, the most powerful king in the Near East, and yet he bowed, he bent to the will of God. Thirdly, and we'll see this more next week, we work better together. Nehemiah couldn't go back to Jerusalem and accomplish his task alone. Nehemiah couldn't do it with a few leaders that he took out to, to survey. All the people had to come together and say, hey, we're going to do this, and we're going to do this together. And most importantly this morning, because prayer has been a significant part of the process with Nehemiah up to this point, most importantly this morning, we need to remember that we have an open invitation to come before our king. You think about Nehemiah approaching Artaxerxes. You didn't ever approach a king without invitation. You didn't ever approach a king because you never knew what kind of mood the king might be in and the risks that you would take to approach the king. You didn't ever approach the king and talk about your problems and, and your feelings. It's a wonder that Artaxerxes even mentioned the sadness on his face, except that he was concerned there might be something evil in his heart. Kings weren't interested in that. You were there to serve them. They, they weren't there to serve you. What about our king? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. Let us approach the throne of grace, that's our king, his throne, with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What a difference our heavenly king is compared to earthly kings.